everyone. Welcome to uh, to Young Israel Southfield. Uh, my name is Rabbi Yapil Morris. I'm the rabbi here at the, uh, the synagogue. It's an honor it's and a pleasure to welcome you here uh, this evening. We have a, a real treat uh, this evening. You know, we're in the high holiday season. Rosh Hashanah is upon us. And uh, when uh, Rosh Hashanah arrives, we think a lot about the past, the previous uh, year. We, uh, we look back, we introspect, we reflect. And one of the things that hopefully we do is that uh, we think of all the goodness, all the blessings that we have in our lives. And it's a time um, not only for repentance, but also a time for gratitude and for being uh, grateful that uh, we all have uh, many challenges in our life, but we also have uh, many uh, blessings and many people who influence our lives, who um, help us along the way, who, who assist us, and uh, who allow us to continue to function and, and often and usually and hopefully to thrive. And so in that spirit, uh, this evening, we have the opportunity to uh, extend gratitude and to look back not only on the previous year, but on back many, many years ago. And to, uh, to think about individuals, like our guest speaker tonight, who really risked everything. They weren't required. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't something that um, if they didn't do it, that somehow they would uh, get in trouble by any human authorities. But for many of them, it was uh, a, a higher authority. It was a, a value system. It was a moral and ethical uh, system that inspired them and that taught them and that guided them and told them what was right and what was just and what had to be done. We're most, most grateful for your presence here this evening. Uh, it's, it's an honor for us. No, to be I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> in, a, in a moment, I'm going to call upon es Esther Posner, who really put this all together to introduce our speaker. But as a appropriate being here in the synagogue and in the shul, and as a um, special... I guess gift in some way to uh, to our guest speaker is to share with you and to read together a song that we're all familiar with and which for her was something that guided her during those very difficult and dark days and really gave her strength along the way. The song that I'm referring to, we say it every day now, twice a day, this time of the year. You have the Sidurim, if you want to follow along in front of you, the David Hashem Orvi Yishi, Psalm 27. Again, it's, uh, it's appropriate uh, for this uh, time of year, um, but I think uh, as you read through it, we probably have a certain perspective in terms of what we're thinking when we recite it, but to think about uh, during the Holocaust and someone who is risking their life to save other people, how these words of David Amalek, King David, how they perhaps would very much resonate and speak and inspire them as they carried out their holy mission. I'll say it first in Hebrew, again we'll say it together, and then we'll read it uh, in English. The David Adonai Ori Biishi Mimi Ira Adonai Baos Kayai Mimi Efkad. The Krov Alai Mariam Lachos Bissarit Sarai Baoi Bali Hima Kashu Vinafalo. If Tachana Alai Machana Loyal Libin to Kumalai Mokama Bizos and Ivotea. Acha Shualti Mes Adonai Osa Avakesh. Shifti Bivesa Adonai Ko Yeme Kayai Lachazos Binom Adonai. Ulavakir behave hello. Ki it's been nani besuko beyom ra yastirino besaisa a hello betsur yoramimini. The yata yoram urushi al oivai si vilsai vedmacha the aloes of face through a shira vazamru la denai. Shema adenai koli ekra vachanini vaanini. Lacha marli bi bakshu panai as panacha adenai avakesh. A tastir panacha mimeni a tapi afa deva as drossi hayisa. Alti Shani the Alta Zveni Lehishi, Ki Ovi the Imi Azavuni, Madanai Yasveni, Horini Adnai Darkacha, Nakini the Ork Mishor, the Manshur Rai, Alti Nani Benefes Sarai, Ki Kombu Vidi Vee de Shaker, Vifea Hamas, Ule Hamanti, the Rose Batuv, Adanai the Eretz Kayim, Kave El Adanai Hazak, the Ahmed Slibacha, the Kave El Adanai. O David, God is my light and my salvation, who shall I fear? God is my life's strength, whom shall I dread? When evildoers approach me to devour my flesh, my tormentors and my foes against me, it is they who stumble and fall. 
Though an army would besiege me, my heart would not fear. Though war would rise against me, in this I trust. One thing I ask of God, that shall I seek, that I dwell in the house of God all the days of my life, to behold the sweetness of God and to contemplate in his sanctuary. Indeed, he will hide me in his shelter on the day of evil. He will conceal me in the concealment of his tent. He will lift me upon a rock. Now my head is raised above my enemies around me, and I will slaughter offerings in his tent, accompanied by joyous song. I will sing and make music to God. God, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious toward me and answer me. In your behalf, my heart, my heart has said, seek my presence. Your presence, God, do I seek. Conceal not your presence from me. Repel not your servant in anger. You have been my helper. Abandon me not. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. But my father and mother have forsaken me. God will gather me in. Teach me your way, God, and lead me on the path of integrity because of my watchful foes. Deliver me not to the wishes of my tormentors, for there have arisen against me false witnesses who breathe violence. Had I not trusted that I would see the goodness of God in the land of life, hope to God, strengthen yourself, and he will give you courage and hope to God. I call upon uh, Esther to uh, give the introduction. I want to thank you all for coming. And um, uh, I want to mention some names <coughs> of people who made this, this evening happen. Uh, first of all, Rabbi Morris, who uh, thought this was a good idea. And I agree with him. Um, Paul Fisher for taking photographs. Um, Ellen Modell for doing the flyer. Donnie Unger for doing the videotaping. Um, and uh, Leah Brakeman, who uh, supported us with her creative efforts. Um, and Michal Corman, who has been my partner in this endeavor from the beginning. Michal will come to my house and, and ask if I recommend any books to her. And um, I recommended Deep's book to Michal. She took it home. And um, when she finished reading it, she said, Esther, let's get in the car. And we're driving to um, Grand Rapids, which is where Deep lives. And we're going to visit her because I want to thank this woman for what she did, all the lives that she saved. And um, I also want to thank, and I don't see her, uh, Cheryl Siegel, are you here? Okay, so Cheryl came to us. Uh, Cheryl lives in Grand Rapids, and she brought Deet, and she's going to drive her home tonight because Deet wants to be back in her own bed tonight, and um, we can all sympathize with that. And uh, when when I woke up this morning, and I, I didn't sleep much last night, but when I I opened my eyes this morning and I heard that rain. And my cell phone is beeping because it's giving me the message that there are flash floods all over town. And I'm like, I wonder if this is going to happen, if you're going to be able to get here. And so we are most, most grateful, Sheriff, for what you did. Um, that's it. You all know the story that I was in Holland, I was born in Holland and I was a young child when Hitler invaded uh, the Netherlands and uh, I went into hiding with my parents and I survived. That's the whole story. Uh, we went into hiding when someone from the underground organization, and it wasn't one organization, it was lots of little cells that somehow sprung up and somehow had so many of the same ideas on how they saved Jewish lives and what they had to do. And they learned as they went along. It wasn't uh, like there was a corporate charter that chart that told you what to do and how to do it. But um, we were found by, uh, someone in my family was found by a Dutch policeman who told her, go into hiding, don't live out in the open like you are. She went into hiding and then sent him to where I lived with my parents in Amsterdam. We went into hiding. Um, I always felt that although we were in different homes, 
I always felt this real Kesher, this real relationship with the people who were in the underground, who came every week to bring us our food stamps, who took care of um, our false IDs. Uh, not for me, I was too young, but uh, for anybody over the age of uh, 12 or 14 needed a, an ID. And um, I want to tell you how I found Deet, and I wasn't looking for her. Erwin and I went to um, Holland, Michigan last year for my birthday uh, in, during the Tulip Festival, and one of the places we went was the uh, Holland Museum. And Holland Museum, on the first floor, it talks about, they have exhibits about how people who came from the Netherlands, uh, the society that they set up in that area of the, of the state. And there are a lot of people from the Netherlands in that area. And uh, it talks about they, they set up the furniture industry. And then when you go upstairs to the second floor, there's the Dutch culture. And the Dutch painting, the Dutch... Um, wooden chests and, and everything that you, you see culturally in the Netherlands. And I stood in front of one painting and I enjoyed it and I looked at the name of the artist and the artist's name was Tenkata. His last name was Tenkata. It's a very typical Dutch name. And um, I'm thinking, why do I know this name? And I said to Erwin, How do, why do I know this name? And, you know, I'm doing a lot of research right now into my family, and, and it, it, not till we were driving home, and all of a sudden I remembered. Um, Tenkata is the name on my father's false ID. So here is my father's ID with a J on it, which, of course, uh, my father had dark hair, and dark eyes, and, and uh, looked very Jewish. But um, everybody had to have a false ID in case during the night, if where you were staying, you had to move to another hiding place, and it was no longer secure and safe for you. You had to at least have a false ID. And here he is, the same picture. No. No. Okay. And this does not have a J on it. And here is the name, take my word for it, Tenkata, which is a very unusual Dutch name. And it, it just, it got to me. So this year for um, the Tulip Festival, we went back and I went straight upstairs and I looked for my, that painting and I'm standing there. And a woman came over and she says to me, um, I'm a docent here, can I help you? And uh, I tell her briefly the story, you know, of how hidden in Holland by the underground. And she says, you know, there's a woman who lives in Grand Rapids who has told her story in a book. And you really have got to read the book. And she gave me the name of the author, Deet Eamon, and the name of the book is Things We Couldn't Say. And we came home and ordered the book and read it. And I said to Erwin, this is my story. This is what happened. This is not just from our point of view as Jews. This is what the Dutch people who, who saved us had okay. to do and how it affected, how their lives were affected by what they did. So I looked, in, I looked up her name and could not find her. She's not listed. She doesn't have a telephone. But um, I tried her publisher, and I tried her church, and nobody would give her me the information. And so I, I said to Erwin, who do we know in Grand Rapids? And he said, you know, there's a Chabad there. <laughs> <laughs> so believe it or not, I called the Chabad rabbi and told him the story that I'm looking for this woman. And he said, we know Deet, just like that. We know Deet. And um, he said, there is someone in our community, Cheryl Siegel, that lady over there, and um, gave me her number. I called her. She was babysitting her grandchildren in Chicago. Thank you. And uh, we, um, I called her, and she said, I'll go there. This I'll, When I come back to Grand Rapids, I'm going to go over there, and I'll talk to Deke, and I'll see what I can work out.
And sure enough, I get a call one morning, about 8.30 in the morning. She says, I'm here with Deet. Uh, she's got her calendar. Grab your calendar and let's set up a date. And Irwin and I drove to Grand Rapids and I met Deet. And we talked for about three hours. And then a couple of weeks later, Cheryl went back and talked to her about coming here because I was very interested in having her address on the show and anybody else. Um, first, I thought, she's fragile, she's old, I can't ask her to come two and a half hours to Detroit. But then, as I was leaving, I said to her, thinking about what are you doing with yourself? And she said, um, oh, well, I go to the Dominican Republic. I <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and I'm like, what do you go to, how do you go to the Dominican Republic? And she says, um, they, they're very corrupt there. There's a lot of money, but uh, only certain people have it. And they don't pay, they don't educate the children. They don't want them to know how to read and write. So they'll find out what's going on in the world. And I go there and I read them stories from the Old Testament when I go there. And um, she's fluent in Spanish. So I I, we went home, and I said, you know, if she can go to the Dominican Republic, <laughs> I can ask her to come to Detroit. And so here she is. She's an incredible, she will tell her story, and uh, maybe we'll have time for some questions and answers at the end. So thank you all for coming, and I'm going to give the floor to Deke. I'm spelled, I'm spoiled here. <laughs> I've done all this time and it's terrific. Thank you for having me. No, I feel also that the story may never be forgotten because it was too horrible. And you can't understand that somebody did that. And uh, I was... Uh, oh, it broke. Wanna take it? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. You get to turn it Let's turn it on. Not anyway, no, this is okay. It's okay. Right, <laughs> come here. Um, where am I? Yeah. Huh? I can hold it. Wait. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Can yeah. you hold it? Yeah. Me? Okay. Well, I was 18 when Hitler in, in the, and I lived in the Netherlands in the Hague. And when Hitler got in power in Germany, he heard all those horrible stories. And he couldn't believe it, you know, that one person can do that. But the, I think there is something <laughs> that the Germans are followers. And the Dutch are not, because we are smaller than Rhode Island, and guess what? We have 16 pol political parties. <laughs> we have the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> But if we think it's important enough, then they start something new. So anyway, uh, we heard what Hitler was doing in Germany. And then uh, so many people from Germany came to the Netherlands. You, always have, you all have heard the name of Anne Frank, but she was not the only one. Many, many came. And they thought the Netherlands had never been in a war for hundreds of years and that they were safe in our country. But uh, Hitler took everybody, you know that story. He took uh, Poland already, and then uh, Spain was pro-Nazi, Belgium and France, they all tried to put up, but he had a very powerful, and he was very scared. And then the evening before, i have never forget it, March 9, May 9 of 40, we heard Hitler speak, I and mean, there was no television at the time, but there was radio. And we listened, and Hitler said, I know that the Dutch are scared, but we will respect their neutrality. That were her little, his little words. I will respect their neutrality, because for, for centuries they haven't been in a war. But while he was saying that, they were already marching in the south of our country. So he was a big liar. And I got so mad. I was just a week before turn 20, and I thought, this guy is evil. Whatever he does, we have to oppose. And then, of course, we were in foot. And he had, and that is funny, he had for our little country put five, one day. Is Hold it closer. Oh, closer? Yes, thank you. Okay. He had put one, uh, one day for the Netherlands. 
but we are so stubborn and we wrote five days. And then you all have maybe heard that he bombarded that big city of Rotterdam. It's the biggest harbor in the world. And uh, he bombarded that. And then we lost so many people that then we handed over. And then we were occupied. And he may started slowly to make all rules. And he hated the Jewish people. And uh, we had already heard that from Germany. So our, and, and never forget it. It's, oh, I get still the shivers if I think of it. Because the newspapers the next day, they still came out. And they were full of victories the next few days of Jewish people who had committed suicide. They preferred that to live under Hitler. So that was horrible. And that told us something too, that how scared they were. And I had many Jewish friends. I worked in an office, and next to me worked, was a Jewish guy. He played beautiful violin, and my brother played beautiful cello. And we had an organ and a piano in our house. It was very musical, and I played horrible piano. <laughs> <laughs> but we played trios, and we had lots of fun. So that was great. So the first rule was, the Jewish people were not allowed to visit the non-Jews anymore. And we said to Herman, that was the guy who always played, played violin, the heck with Hitler, you come. He said, I don't dare to. And I went often to his house also because he had a sister and they were friends. And uh, I said, I'm coming. He said, don't do it because you know, you bring my, yourself in danger and surely my parents. So then I didn't see him many times anymore. And then he got started in our country. They couldn't go in the tram, they couldn't go in the autobuses, they couldn't, they had to wear a yellow star. I have still one here because I took them off of the first time, when the very first, when we helped them, we took their star off, of course, because that was the sign that they were Jewish. So that was the first thing. And then Hitler started to make all rules. They, like I say, we weren't allowed to visit them, they weren't allowed to visit us. Then whole sections of the cities were forbidden for them. They could only live where many uh, a few Jewish store, stores, and they didn't get any supplies. So it was a terrible time for the Jewish people. And then he started really, he started that they got a call that they had to report. There was curfew from, if we had behaved, it was from 11 to 6 in the morning, but if we had been naughty, then it was from 8 to 11, and often it was from 8 to 11 because we didn't want to obey him. And we are really very stubborn. Maybe you have Jewish friends, and you know that we are stubborn. <laughs> so anyway, that's what happened. And then he started uh, telling that they could not go in the buses, not in the train, not in all many, the parks. Everything was forbidden. In the end, you could only better say where they were allowed, and it was in our own street. And the synagogues were closed, and they were all smudged with horrible things, and it was us. It was a terrible time. And Herman, then all of a sudden, Herman phoned me, and he said, Diet, I have to talk to you. And I was dating a wonderful guy, Heinz Sietzma. And, uh, he, and then when I met Herman, I said, well, you can come to my house. He said, I don't dare to, and you may not come to my house too. So we met, met in the street. And he said, did we got a letter that we have to repay? During the curfew, we have to report at a railroad station. And I said, he said, what should I do? I said, don't go, don't go. You have heard what Hitler did. He said, yeah, but what can we do? I said, tonight I see my boyfriend and I'll tell him. And he probably has ideas. So I told him at night. He said, no, Herman can't go. He said, you know what? His father was the principal of a country school, where I, I don't know if you know the Netherlands, but it is the failure that is a part of the Netherlands. It's very beautiful. And there was a school in a city near Nijkerk, it's a rather big city, close by just on the border. And there, this guy, my fiancé's father was the principal. He says, uh, and he knows all those kids in the homes 
He said, we can find a place for Herman on one of the farms. And sure enough, they found a place. So then, but Herman had a girlfriend. And he said, yeah, but she's also Jewish and she's also scared. Her name was Ada. And he had a sister, Rosa. And so the three of them said, can you find those places? So then my fiance asked again, the farmers, okay, send them, send them, no problem. And the, because there was so little food, everything went to Germany. And we, in the end, we had so little, that, uh, at everything on ration cards, and then there were all little square, squares. Uh, during that week, you can, on this thing, when loaf, on that, a little bit of meat, on that, it was, it was pitiful what you had, what you could eat. It was for a normal person, not even for two weeks, and it had, was, had to last a month. So it was a terrible time. And then to hide them, because the moment they went in hiding, they didn't get the ration cards anymore, of course, because they could not go to the German offices <coughs> and show their ID. And that was another thing. We all had to have identification cards. And that had everything on it. I'm glad that you showed it. Yeah, it's, it's very small. But it had your photo. Deed at the age of 20. And your signature. And then a, a stamp from the city where you lived. And all the Jews had a big fat black J on it, Jew. And they had to wear that. So the first thing that we told the Jewish people, the people we were hiding, of course, the stare of, and we all said, that thing is not valid, we will find. And it was kind of a problem, but we made friends everywhere. And there were offices where you had to go to get, when you were 14, you had to get that ID, that identification card the ID. And so on 14, but in those offices, there were all Dutch people working still, and they wanted to quit, but the Germans didn't let them quit. They had to stay there, whether they wanted or not. And that turned out to be so good, because then we had contact in those circles. So then <coughs> we prayed about it, and then after prayer, we did the robbery, and we stole all the blanks. <laughs> It was kind of funny. I think that God has had never such crazy prayers to ask to bless a robbery. But he did. And we did that for two, two and a half years that nobody was arrested. And then we could give all those Jewish people, we had a terrific falsifier. He was also Jewish. And he had one of the best seats because he helped us so much. And we called him, we did never call him by their real name. And he was Uncle Ben. And all the Jewish people who were in hiding, you know, they had to change their names because they, some, some are very, Cohen is a very Jewish name. So we all gave them false papers, just real Dutch names. And then the fingerprints and whatever. So they all had a paper. But uh, this happened and then I was asked for Herman to find a place and for Rosa and for Ada, and then Ada's mother said, I want also, can you find a place? And within two or three weeks, we had over 60 people, six all, not just one six, but six all, who asked, can you find places? And my fiance went to the Helleland, where all those farmers are, and all the farmers said, you sure, sure, send them, send them. And we tried to get couples together, but it wasn't always where they were willing to take one person because really when you had a Jew, and it was in the papers and on the, on the radio, if you hide a Jew, you will be treated as a Jew. So then you had to go to wherever. But it was a terrible time. And then we brought our friend Rosa to a farm and she was there the whole war. And they did, the, the neighbors did not know that she was Jewish. And we had given her other papers too. But there was such a hunger that we said, well, the people from the Hague come to the farms and here, well, here is more food. So that under that uh, thing. But there were also another couple, and that is really sad, because they were all older and they could not 
uh, really walk so far, very good anymore. And they were in a little room on a big house in the back, up the high up, where the people never came. And, uh, and if that was in all the houses, we had to find out a place that maybe you have heard of the hiding place from Corrie and Rome. I don't know if you've heard that. But I mean, all the homes had the place whoever had used where they could hide then. It could be behind the wall that they had a false wall built and the, the uh, opening that they could go in. But every house, it was terrible with all the stuff that they had to do. And then well, the big problem was to get every month the, the food for them, the, the ration cards. So then we had every day to do, every uh, month to do a robbery. <laughs> like I told already, that we first prayed if God would bless our robbery. <laughs> and I don't think there are uh, many robberies nowadays that they first ask a blessing. <laughs> to such circumstances, for instance, at Twelve Farm, there we had a couple. And it was a farmhouse. And at that time, they had, the, they had in the winter, I don't know if you, if you have it here too at the farm, but in the winter the cows are inside. And then they all stay in, and then behind where there is, there is what they call the herb in the Netherlands. But I, it is a hollow thing where all their pee and poo falls in, and then it goes to the corner. And then we had a, a couple, and they had made a little separation, and they were at the end. So, but they also had to go to, it, it was a situation, oh, it was terrible sometimes. And there was one address they told me, can you go there, because that is desperate. And they won't let you in, and you have to give say, the password. And they gave me a password. And I went there, and it was at a big street in the Hague, where all the traffic was, and the stores. And it was, uh, because the Netherlands, here, you know, you, when you build, you go that way. But in the Netherlands, because we are so small, we go that way. So we have second floor and third floor. And this was about, a, you had to go on the stairs, and then there was a platform, and there were four doors. So downstairs were, of course, but on, this was on the first floor, and the other doors were for the second floor. And I had to ring the bell, and it turned out to be on the second floor. And I said the password, and they let me in. And I could not believe what I saw, because I told you that we put one, and if possible, a couple at the farms in that part of the Netherlands, what is, what is uh, wider, you know. And this was in the heart of the Hague, in a big, busy street. And I stood there, and in that house, it was built for one person. <coughs> the new house is especially for a bit cheaper, you know. And it is just a small bedroom, a living room, a kitchenette, very small, and then a toilet that is at the same time a shower, and then a little platform. And that woman there, her name was Mies, and I never forget it. She had 29 Jews living in that small apartment. And I said, how do you do that? And while I'm talking to her, I see, because I told you it was on the second floor, I hear a water flush from the toilet. In it. I said, do you hear that? She said, yes. She did not see the danger. And I said, if you live, I said, did you live here always alone? She said, yeah. I said, how many years? Eight years. I said, how, time, how many times a day did you flush the toilet? Four times, maybe five times, I don't know. I said, then they can hear that you flush. And now you are here with 29 people. <laughs> how many times? That alone is already a giveaway. And as do you know if they are Nazis? He said, I don't know. She had a golden heart and she wanted to help, but she did not use her noodle. <laughs> so, no, she didn't. It was terrible. I said, Miss, I said, I'll try to get so many of the Jewish people out and that did you keep your stuck with two or three. That is, uh, I had her down to eight 
and I was so happy. And then I come in and she has eight new ones, 60 again. I said, I, you know, I don't know, I can't find places anymore because wherever they are willing to, they have already taken it. And then when they, and that was terrible, when old men there passed away. And what do you do? How do you get them out? It was on a portal and on the second floor. So I didn't know. I said, what can we do? But like I say, there was no food anymore. And you know what people did? When you get married, you get so many beautiful presents. And many of them you never use. So all that Jewish... Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was just wishing. Thank you. I was just <coughs> thinking, what can we do, you know, to, to get the, the people away? And that was, uh, if you had a pl place in the, in the country, then you had to take the train from the Hague. And often I found a place, but then you had to change the plane three times. For instance, you could go to Utrecht, and you don't know what it is, but then right away there was another train, I guess and you get, went to Am Amersfoort, and then there was another plane that went then where they had to go, and then you had to walk a long distance. But anyway, it was horrible. And you know, some people, and you can't help it what you look, but they look so very Jews. And then there was this couple, and it was written all over him, Jew. I mean, and he wanted, begged me to bring me to the country, and his wife. And I said, well, I, I will do it, but I, you know, I'll give you a false ID, but you have to sit the whole road with a newspaper in front of your face. And I said, don't let it down one second, because then you will be arrested. It was so terrible, all the things. And like in that house of Mies, that she had the 29 Jewish people. What do you do with the bathroom? I mean, there are so, Simple things were such big problems that it was terrible. Anyway, I took that couple that was very Jewish and they wanted so much and they begged me to. And what also a problem was the food was expensive. So, and some they had first to use their own money, but then the money was finished and then you don't set them on the street. So then, apart from that, we had to do fundraising. And we said that it was for helping Jewish people, but we didn't say where or what or how. So that was also that kept you busy. It was, it was a terrible time. And then I remember that I had this to bring these very Jewish people. And it was a beautiful place. It was a big monastery and a high wall and all roads around it. And there was a long way to get there. So if they were hiding there, it was a little shed, a, a, a couple that took care of the thing, and they were willing to, to take, take them. It was ideal because you could already on that long road see that if they were coming, and they could shoot in the woods. So that was an ideal place. And, I, and they had a 16-year-old son, Martin, I never forget that. So I brought him there, and that father looked so very Jewish, so I said, don't for one second let the paper down. And I had to take three trains. And I never forget, we were in Utrecht, that is a very big station, and he lost it, he lost, what do you call that, the tzit, tzit, Yeah, he lost it. And he stopped and he started looking. And, and he was so Jewish. I said, he said, I lost my, it said whatever they call. I said, I looked, get in the train, get in the train. So I, I found it, it was leather, it's made of leather. Huh? So I found it and I gave it to him. He was ready to be arrested for that. So then in the train too, I said, when here, and then a big distance, nothing, and then his wife, and then, the son, Martin, and then I had to keep an eye on all of them. And I said, if in the train, if any of you are being arrested, I can't stop. The other two have to be saved. So 
if, if that happens. It's horrible, but I, I don't know what to do, all right. But I got them all at that place. And it was a hotel. And they did get any guests. The people had no money anymore, so they were on the third of bank. It was a little hotel in the woods. It was ideal, because they could see if the Gestapo was coming, they had uniforms, and they could see, and then they could still walk in the woods and everything. So that was beautiful. But then, after <laughs> every month, I went to bring the ration card and to pay the people who had them, because they also had very little, oh no, the non-use. So they needed that money for the food. The food was already so expensive. And we stole ration cards from the Germans to give to the people who were taking Jewish people in. It, it was a crazy time. We did all things that kind of were a normal time forbidden. But then, uh, one time I come there, I went at once a month, and they started writing each other. You didn't think of it. But I mean, all of a sudden, for the friends and family, they had disappeared. And they wrote. So then the family knew where they were, which was a danger for the people who had them. So we had to forbid them to write each other. I said, I'll come every month. I have to do the paying anyway. And then you can give me the letters, and I won't open them. I'm not in. But then <laughs> you know, I had the craziest thing. Just think, everything Jewish is being arrested. And it turned out that at your special thing, all of a sudden they had matzos. Now, is anything more Jewish than matzos? <laughs> 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 yeah, you, every time there was something that I think, oh Lord, help, help, help. And you got help, I have to say that. That's why I love Psalm 27 so much for it. It said that uh, even when you are in danger, the Lord will help me and hide me in his tent. And, and that is so. The Bible was really my strength. And Psalm 27 was really my thing. I read it every day. And I got back with you. And from my heart, I knew it. But anyway. These were all things that happened. And then at one point, uh, I come in the woods there, and the Jewish family isn't there anymore. I said, where are they? He said, they left because Martin was so bored stiff in that place with the 29 Jews. There they did on Saturday night <coughs> games and things, and here he was alone, and he was so bored, and he pestered his parents so long that they went back. And I didn't know it. And I was furious. And also, <laughs> yeah, you have the craziest thing. That Jewish, one Jewish lady was very happy. And she had a corset. And you know, it's two rooms where they were. I mean, a living room and a bedroom. And what those people had done, you came in and you thought it was a divan. But it were all piled up matters. It was a beautiful throw over it. Then at night, at that was spread out, and that's where they slept. And uh, this was the Jewish man who died. I was old, he was an old man. And then they said, oh Lord, what do we do? And then there was a good guy who owned a lot of land, and it was a park also, and a wall around it. And he said, you may bury him on my face. But how, he was in that house with 29. So, and because every, like I say, when you are married, you get a lot of stuff. And that was all changed for food, you know, that they, the people who, who really collected things they had a good time because for food, they, they got everything. And then we took a carpet and we wrapped the man in, the, the man who had passed away. And then my fiance and another friend carried him out. But the neighbors thought, oh, they are changing their carpet for food. Mm -hmm. But really, it was the cemetery, it was the funeral from this man. And after the war, we told other people, and then he was buried in a Jewish uh, cemetery. But you never know, every time another one was expecting a baby, I said, what do we do? And when, when Homer we helped, had a baby, and uh, Another group would take care of her. And that maybe that was maybe three or four months. 
And while well, the Gestapo was looking, <coughs> her baby started to scream. And she had to hold her hands on it. And it lasted so long that the Gestapo was dead, the baby was dead. And all those horrible things happened, you know, what a normal thing. It, it was a terrible thing, a terrible thing. And then. Well, <coughs> she takes her good care of me. Because <laughs> she took good care of people like me. At one point, somebody knew it and betrayed me. And I was at my job, and the phone rings, and it is, uh, you know, First, I had a girlfriend, and she worked for the government, and uh, she had to do a lot also with, with presents and whatever. And then I was betrayed, and the Gestapo came to my parents' house, and I was not home. But my brother, who had false papers that he was in the food service, he was home, and he was scared, of course. And he said, where is uh, Diet, or Berendina? And he says, well, she is at her job. Where is that? So he says, well, she just changed. I don't know where she is right now. So he tried to get out of it. But when that was over, he phoned right away where I worked. But I was for my work. I was somewhere else at the printing thing from the country. And then uh, and my friend worked there. Anyway, I was just warned in time. And then I could never go home anymore because the Gestapo kept the eye and they were the first every night and you had to be home at 11, that was curfew. And so when I was a young girl, I was 19 or 20, so the Gestapo came and said, uh, where is she? And my father said, we don't know where she is, she is so wild and she, we don't know one thing what she's doing. Oh, he said, no, and I come back and uh, what time I shoot? She should be home at 11 o'clock. I was 19 or 20. And I was, of course, not home because I was warned that they were looking for me. So then they came back and they said, <laughs> it's kind of funny. They came and they said to my father, where is she? And my father said, we have such a trouble with that girl. We never know where she is. <laughs> and she couldn't come home at curfew. And she stays away for days. And then, <laughs> They my fiancé's name, and they loved my fiancé, and he was the leader of our group, and his name was Hein Sietzma. And then uh, they said, do you know Hein Sietzma? My father said, oh, that is a terrible guy. He has really made that she is what he's doing now, and we don't see him, and he may not set a foot in this house, and he was practically there. So my father did so good, like I was terrible. And in the end, and they came back and back and back, and I, of course, I was never home anymore. And then one of those guys patted my father's shoulder, and I said, he says, I know what you're going through. I have a daughter just the same. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it was the most funny, he wrote his name and his phone number, and he was, he was from the Gestapo. And he said, when she comes home, don't say a thing and click and phone me behind. I thought, that's what I'll do. <laughs> and then I hadn't been home for a long time. And I longed so much to see them that I, one evening I let friends go to my parents who regularly went there. I went to their address. I said, can you say, and they leave the door open a jar, because it was always it was a lock. And that I slip in from the corner, and that I just slip a moment in, and that I see my father and mother. So that's what happened. So then my father, when I came in, I had never seen him cry, and I remember that I came in, and mom was in the kitchen, and my father was also something. And when he saw me, he turned around and he walk, walks away. And I thought, oh, he is angry that I bought all the time the Gestapo here. And then it turned out he was crying. I'd never seen him cry. And he was so happy that I was there. So then uh, that was also kind of funny that I came home 
And then the guy said, uh, my daughter is just a second. <laughs> and I still have this for that card that he wrote. I kept that in my hair. Saying, his name was Lemke. Anyway, uh, I couldn't go home anymore for a long, long time, a little after the war. But I had all addresses where I could be, so. And uh, I had told already that he stole those ration cards. And then we had to spread them out. You have another idea? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my other idea is for all of you to buy the book. And um, uh, Michal has these cards which you brought, or uh, somebody gave us. And uh, it, if you want to buy the book, you can send away for it and read the rest of the story. I think, uh, tell about the end. You can tell about the end, okay? The end? The end. Oh, yeah. Well, the, 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 this went on for a long time. And then I was betrayed and put in a prison. And uh, in the prison was also horrible because you got in the morning one little pail with water that you had to wash your face and your body and your hair. And you did not get a towel and no soap. It was a horrible time. And then. Uh, no toilet paper and no toilet. You had to go on the drum in the corner. And la later, this, there were so many people who were put in prison that in a one person cell, I was with four of us. And I remember when I had to go to my hearing that one of them was also a Christian. And she says to me, Did I, oh, really? I was Wilhelmina. Really, really. Um, and this, uh, I think it is so beautiful. I'm going to storm the gates of heaven for you. Now that is really something. So anyway, I got through the war to the end. And then uh, we heard the Allies close by. And I'm sad, uh, Rotterdam was bombarded. And they were losing at long last. And so we were very happy that we saw the end coming. And uh, Hitler was, uh, Hitler, Hitler. You heard, didn't hear about him anymore. And the guy in the Netherlands, who was the leader from the Nazis, Mussert, he took off and he disappeared. And many people, but then all the people who were pro-German, they wanted, they went in from the Netherlands, it's on the coast, they went into Germany. But then our groups uh, grabbed them and also uh, they were, sentenced to death and they, in Nuremberg, you know, there was the big uh, t trial from all the war criminals and there were many killed. But then at long last we were freed from the Netherlands. And then we had to wait who would come back. And so many never came back. From our group we had nine guys and I was the only girl and seven didn't come back. So. You can't say that it was a heavy liberation. And with all the stuff that had happened, I couldn't stay in the Netherlands. And I was engaged, and we had our wedding license. I had my wedding dress, but he didn't come back. Either he was killed in Dachau. And then uh, I heard that I studied nursing for three years. And then I became a nurse. And I, he has another good idea. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I wonder if there are any questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can we take some questions? Grand Rapids. Did you go from, from the Netherlands straight to Grand Rapids? Did you have family? Uh, what <coughs> other after you left the Netherlands? Tell them about that family and why you came to Grand Rapids. Well, with all the stuff I couldn't say in the Netherlands. And my fiancé works for Shell Oil and Shell loved him and he didn't come back and they knew that we were engaged so then they asked me uh, i said i want to leave he said do you have a country where you would like to go because shell has everywhere and i said no and then they mentioned countries mombasa and this and then they said venezuela i said do they speak spanish there he said yes what do you ask i said well i have degrees in spanish he said you go to venezuela so I was there for over 10 years and nurse in the Shell Hospital. And uh, there I met a guy. And then later we married here. He was also in, in Stuttgart. 
from the war. So, <coughs> and then I was married. But in the meantime, I was, I for years I couldn't think of somebody else, only my fiance that I married when I was 39. And when I was 41, I had a boy. And at 43, I had a girl. So I do everything 20 years later than other. <laughs> but that's how my life is now. And I'm very happy because I, I met a guy in, uh, in Venezuela, my fiance, and then I married him and I came to America. And then that marriage, he became mentally ill, very cool to the kids. So I had to leave him. And here I had family in Grand Rapids. So then I thought, well, the kids are American. I was tempted to go back to the Netherlands where all my family was. But the kids were American and I thought, you live for your children. So I stayed here. And I became expert manager and had to ship big ovens all over the world, even to Iran. <laughs> they still owe us money, millions. <laughs> but anyway, so that's how I am here now. And then I think, you know, uh, that so many people don't know about Second World War, and then when they ask me, then I tell about it. But I can only say God is very good, because I was never alone, and I scraped in the wall. Well, I'm a Christian, and there's many Jewish people, but it says in the Bible, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, and that is God. God is always with us wherever we are. And whatever our hurt is, and there will probably be here people who are hurt and who are sad, but God is always there, and He gives His strength, and you're never, never alone. And when I was in the prison, they had taken everything away. I had the prison dress, and, and they asked me all stuff in German, and I made my head made up my mind I wouldn't speak one word of German while they were in our country. So then I said, I don't know what you're saying, and they had to call a translator, and that made it much longer, but this gave me twice the time of, to think what my answer was. <laughs> I was under a false name and a false thing, so it was all helpful. And I can only say that God has always been there, and he will also be with you. And he loves us. And he made us. And we are his children. We got a couple more questions. I was just wondering, did you ever keep up with any of the people who you hit after and the war? Beth, you have to say, did you ever keep up with the people who you hit after the war? Yeah. Many, but they were the ones in their forties. They have, of course, died. I was in my tw I was twenty, and now I'm ninety-six. <laughs> this is seventy years, seventy years ago. So the middle age old, but the younger Rosa, the first one, she was still she was two years older. I have to write because she's in another. But she writes once a year that they keep contact, and there was other people who helped too, and the farmers to the Jewish people and their children. They were then little, but they are now big. But they still remember the Jewish people because we always called them uncle and aunt because otherwise the neighbors would be suspicious, you know, that, oh, that's an aunt or that's an uncle. And you have the word Burman, Burman, for those who are, that means neighbor. So then you don't mention names. Uh, were you ever honored by Yad Vashem for your heroism? Can you tell us about that? Were you ever honored by Yad Vashem? <coughs> ever? Honored by Yad Vashem. Yeah, I have Yad Vashem. Yeah. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> no, that is really something. And what also happens, and I never, I get once a year mostly that a Jewish person who I don't know from Adam, and they come to my house and they want to talk to me. And they always steer it to money. And that, but I remember now that, that they are checking if I need help. And I don't need it, but it makes me feel very good that they are so grateful. And I'm very proud that I have you, Tricia. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Ray. Thank you very much. Somebody, when I shook hands, said, behind me, knew it, and she said, she has been in this happening a prison. It was a horrible prison. And the king, the king said, yes. I said, yes. And he called the morning. He said, when we have lunch, I will perfect sit next to me. And then he took my hand, and I walked hand in hand with the king of the Netherlands. Oh. And he is surrounded by security. Oh, I have all very exciting things, even now. And when I went to visit her, I brought an orange tablecloth. <laughs> and she, after we ate, she made me wrap it up so she could keep it. <laughs> and I will to the same one thing. When I left high school, I'll do that. I'll do this one of this. What do you hope for? What do you wish for your life? I said, I don't care if I'll be rich or poor, if only my life will be dull. <laughs> and it has never been so. Never been so. For years has been so for after me. And now that I'm old, you know that I go every year to the Dominican Republic to help and with the King Queen and the Queen. I mean,